<clears throat> Turn this evening to read, please, the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, chapter 18. Well, read the whole chapter. I know Proverbs is not really a, a book that's easily divided into chapters. Um, for the greater part, of course, it is a, a collection of texts, really. But nevertheless, we'll, um, there's only one verse we want to look at tonight. But we'll, read, we'll take the time to read the whole chapter. So Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. And this is God's word, so let us hear it carefully. Through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy reproach. The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked, to overthrow the righteous in judgment. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and as an high wall in his own conceit. Before destruction the heart of man is haughty, and before honour is humility. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. A man's gift maketh room for him, and bringeth him before great men. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbour cometh and searcheth him. The lot causeth contentions to cease, and parteth between the mighty. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favour of the Lord. The poor useth entreaties, but the rich answereth roughly. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. And God bless the reading of his truth. Verse 10 tonight, just turn your who seek refuge from all manner of distresses and oppressions uh, by taking our refuge in God himself. Uh, of course, Jehovah's name, when it talks about the name of the Lord, we understand that to mean more than just a title or a word that designates a particular individual. Name stands for that as a title, but also for everything about the person whose name that is. Uh, the name makes us think of the individual, their nature, their character, everything about them. When somebody mentions a name to you of a known uh, acquaintance or a friend or even somebody that is infamous, their name makes you think of more than just uh, that word that is used to, to separate them out from the rest of humanity. It says a lot about their card, and so it is here. The name of the Lord is to cause us to think about more than just the title, but about God himself. And perhaps as you are aware, the name Jehovah really comes from the, the Hebrew word that means to be or to exist. And that's why when Moses, remember, asked uh, what he should say to the children of Israel in Egypt, who should I say has sent me? And the response to that from God, when, when God conveys to Moses a name, 
to tell the children of Israel. He says, tell them that I am, that I am hath sent thee. And so Jehovah really means simply that God is, that he exists. Uh, and so that's really the essence of this name. And it's a name, well, because we remember that God has various titles, other Hebrew names that we may or may not be familiar with, like Adonai or Elohim. Uh, Jehovah signifies something uh, that distinguishes it apart from those other names or from those other names. And it's really associated with his covenanting, with his revealing, and with his redeeming. Let me read what one commentator had to say. He said that consciousness of danger induces even the animal creation to seek for a refuge. And I think by that he's talking about what the uh, writer of the Proverbs says a little bit later about the conies. The conies are a, a feeble folk, but they hide themselves in the rocks. Uh, to, to man, a strong tower offers such a covert. But man, as a sinner, does he realize his imminent peril, his threatened ruin? Oh, let him believe his welcome into the strong tower set before him. Such is the name of the Lord, not the bare outward words operating as a charm, but his character, that by which he is known as a man by his name. The full declaration of his name sets out most powerfully the strength of the tower. Every letter adds confirmation to our faith. Every renewed manifestation brings a fresh sunbeam of light and blessing. And so to think about the name of the Lord as a strong tower, think first of all that we're talking here about the one who is absolute, the one who is absolute and unique. So Jehovah is a little bit unusual in that you cannot have it in a plural form. And nowhere do we read in the scriptures of our or my Jehovah. Uh, it's not uh, in a sense relational. So you can talk about my God or our God as distinct from your God or their God. But you can't talk about my Jehovah as distinct from somebody else's Jehovah because you cannot have two Jehovahs. You can't have two beings that simply exist by reason of the fact that they exist because they would somewhat oppose each other. And so the Lord is absolute. Jehovah simply is. And uh, one Jewish commentator, Moses uh, Maimonides, said of Jehovah that all the names of God which occur in Scripture are derived from his works except one, and that is Jehovah. And this is called the plain name because it teaches plainly and unequivocally of the substance of God. So he simply is. So there is a strong tower. It simply exists that there is a place of refuge. So God as a refuge simply is. He is there. There's no question. There's no uh, need for any doubt about its existence or whether or not it is real, real or, or, or there. God is, therefore, there is a place of refuge. And that absolute uh, existence reminds us that whether or not we can see or sense or feel the existence of God or his being or his nature or character, it's there. Right? And in a similar way that we may not know that this that we can't see the sun on a cloudy day. If it's cloudy and cold and it's dark and it's damp, there's very little to impress upon us the fact that the sun is there. Take it a stage further, I suppose, on a dark, cold, wintry night when it's cold and it's dark and you can see nothing and you have no warmth. What evidence is there in a sense that there is the sun? We have to take it a stage further then, don't we? It has to be cloudy and you can't see the moon. What evidence is there that the sun is there? There's very little evidence. There's very little that your senses have to suggest that the sun is there. And yet, you know that the sun is there. You know simply, if, if for no other reason, you know that the, the solar system of which we are a part, you know that life here on planet Earth simply cannot exist without the sun. We need the sun. You, you know from what we know of, of the cycles of day and night, you know from experience sufficient to say the sun is there. I can't see it. I can't feel its warmth. Uh, I have no real sensory perception of the sun, but it's there. And there are times when we are in darkness 
There are times when our situation and circumstances mean that we feel very little, we sense very little of the presence of God. But we need to be resolved in our own understanding and have it settled in our conviction. God is there. There is a place of refuge. Though it is unseen, though it is unfelt, God is there. And he doesn't change or alter. So the the nature of God in this respect as a place of refuge doesn't change. The place of refuge does not suddenly become become a place of imprisonment. The place of safety doesn't suddenly become a place of peril and danger. The place of welcome suddenly does not change to become a place of hostility and where we are caused to feel abandoned. God is unchanging and he reminded the children of Israel of this, did he not? I am the Lord, Uh, I change not. And therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. It was the fact that God is unchanging that even the sons of Jacob, even the sons of one who is self-reliant and twisted, they are not consumed because God doesn't alter in his purposes or his attitude towards his people. So he is always a place of refuge for uh, his own. And he exists in this particular way. We also remember that he's the covenanting one. So here's the the covenantal name of God. Uh, Elohim, that other name that I mentioned, is a covenanting name in terms of creation. That's fair enough to say. That's the, the earlier name that is used to designate and to denote God. But however, it is as Jehovah that God reveals himself in terms of a redemptive covenant. So in terms of redemption, in terms of the covenant of redemption, God reveals himself to those people within that covenant as Jehovah. So in terms of his holiness, in terms of his righteousness, in terms of his saving power, it is Jehovah that we are brought to view. Again, therefore, the safety of the child of God is bound up in the one who redeems his people, the one who covenants to do that, the one who determines within himself to remain faithful to that covenant commitment that he has made. And he has made it, and he has made it not with you or me, It is not dependent, therefore, on our success, but that covenant commitment has been made with the Lord Jesus Christ to benefit you and me. So it doesn't change in the sense that the covenant has been made with one who himself doesn't change, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so uh, we, we can rest in that covenantal name of God. In fact, uh, and the the, the quotation earlier from Charles Bridges, uh, he he talked about how the full declaration of this name sets out most powerfully the strength of the tower. Every letter adds confirmation to our faith. And I think he's referring there to what happened when uh, Moses uh, asked to see the Lord, to see the glory of God. And what did God do? Well, Uh, Moses couldn't see God. He couldn't look upon his face. So God reveals his name to Moses. He declares his name, the Lord God, uh, Jehovah, Jehovah, as it would be, Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That's the strong tower that we run to. That's the place of safety and refuge to whom we go. And he is also if you like, the revealing one, the one who reveals himself, who makes himself known. This is who Jehovah is. So again, uh, uh, with the patriarchs, he reveals himself as Jehovah. Again, this is the, the name then that is given to the children of Israel so that they would know that that's who uh, has sent Moses to them for this purpose of leading them out of captivity. And God makes himself 
more fully known from one generation to the next. There's progressive revelation all the way through the Old Testament. People learn a little bit more about God, uh, stage by stage, epoch by epoch, as we go through the Old Testament period, until we come right up into the New Testament period, when there's a full revelation of God. God makes himself known in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see God revealed clearly in the person of the Saviour. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And so God makes himself known. In other words, God declares that he is, and he declares himself in these terms of redemptive covenant keeping as the unchanging one, as the absolute one. And he's revealing himself to his people and telling us that there is a place of safety and a place of refuge. There's a place to which we can turn, one to whom we can turn in all of our distresses. And so when we read here that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, we are to have in mind uh, these things. And he is a strong tower. Let me uh, quote again, this time from Matthew Henry. Uh, he puts it well. God's sufficiency for the saints. His name is a strong tower for them in which they may take rest when they are weary and take sanctuary when they are pursued, where they may be lifted up above their enemies and fortified against them. There is enough in God and in the discoveries which he has made of himself to us to make us easy at all times. The wealth laid up in this tower is enough to enrich them, to be a continual feast and a continuing treasure to them. The strength of this tower is enough to protect them. The name of the Lord is all that whereby he has made himself known as God and our God, not only his titles and attributes, but his covenant and all the promises of it. These make up a tower, a strong tower, impregnant, impenetrable, impregnable for all God's people. And so it is, it is strong. Henry is making the point here in every, in every sense. It protects us from the uh, onslaught of the enemy. Uh, the enemy cannot get in. The enemy cannot touch us there. Uh, inside we find abundant riches. There's no fear of being in this strong tower trying to be preserved from the enemy outside, only to perish in the inside for the lack of what we need. There's a richness, this continual banqueting and treasure that is inside. And it's not a, a hard place to be in the Lord. It's not a place of bare refuge like some uh, a hole in a cave that is certainly a strong defensive position, but incredibly uncomfortable and wearying to be in. But rather, being in the Lord is to find the greatest comfort and the greatest ease. It is the one place above all others that we can truly find repose and rest and security and joy and sustenance and supply of all things. So we ought to run to him with a sense of anticipation, with a sense of joyfulness that here for me is a refuge that never changes, it never moves, it never alters, it never gets any further away from me. Think of Israel, the whole cities of refuge scheme that God uh, implemented for them. And it was designed, wasn't it, so that wherever you were in the land of Israel, you were always more or less uh, equally distant from a city of refuge. They weren't all up in the north or all down in the south. Uh, it was as easy to, to access one as another wherever you were in the land. You were equidistant from them. And, and in a sense, the Lord is like that, isn't he? He's, he's not hard to reach. He's within striking distance. He's there for us. And he woos us to himself. And he says that he, in all of his goodness, in all of his grace, in all of his love and mercy and faithfulness, exists as a strong tower. And we're told that the righteous... <clears throat> The Lord Jesus, and bear in mind that 
he speaks then as the God who has revealed himself here. The Lord Jesus invites all to come to him. He invites the weary to come to him and find rest. He invites uh, sinners of all uh, kinds to, to come to him in the knowledge that him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And if we run to him, then we find safety and security in him. And therefore, when it says the righteous uh, runneth unto it and is safe, surely it is the act of one running to the Lord to hide in him that identifies the righteous as being the righteous. Who turns to the Lord for safety? But those who have been made righteous, declared righteous by God, those who have been redeemed, those who have been renewed. They are those who see something in the Lord that they desire, that they require, and they run to him. So that doesn't make them righteous in themselves. Uh, it's not their act of running that makes them righteous, but it identifies them as being the righteous ones. And so we are not to look to something within ourselves as an incentive or as a qualification that we, we can think to run to the Lord, to hide in Him and to be kept safe by Him. But we are to simply go to His. And when we do go and when we find ourselves secure, then we can take comfort in the knowledge that this identifies me as being someone who has trusted in the Lord, who has faith in Him. And it is the just who are saved and who live by faith. And so again, to, to use the cities of refuge um, illustration, uh, in a sense, the only thing that qualified you to run to the city of refuge was the fact that you were a manslayer, that you had uh, you happened to be guilty of manslaughter, really. Uh, and, and yet your confidence is, is not so much in looking at yourself and qualifying yourself to flee. It's in, the, it's in the nature of the city that you flee to. It's in the nature of the word of law that established the city uh, to be what it is, that your confidence is in that. And you, you take hope in that and you run there, not thinking so much about your qualifications to be there, but simply that you must be there. And we run to the Lord for safety because we sense our own vulnerability, because we sense our own weakness, because we know ourselves to be what we are. Again, to quote a commentator, he says this, Take again the child of God, feeble, distressed, assaulted. They would say, What if I should return to the world, look back, give up my profession, yield to my own deceitful heart, and perish at last with aggravated condemnation. Well, he says, basically, if, if that's how you're thinking, you're walking outside the gates of your tower. No wonder that your imprudence exposes you to the fiery darts of the wicked. If that's how you're thinking, you're not in the tower. Right? What, what's the problem? You're, you're not sheltering. You're outside. You're vulnerable. You're sensing your vulnerability. And the thing to do is not to uh, upbraid yourself for your foolishness of being outside. It's not to scold yourself and to punish yourself for being outside and saying, well, because I'm outside, therefore I must punish myself by staying outside a little while longer. No, the thing to do when you're outside and vulnerable is get inside, run, flee. Flee actively, vigorously to get in. And so the commentator says, Read again the name of the Lord. Go back within the walls. See upon the tower the name. I am the Lord. I change not. Read the direction to trust in it. Who is there among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Mark the warrant of experience in this trust. They that know thy name shall put their trust in thee, for thy Lord hast not forsaken them that seek thee. 
And so we are encouraged to look to the Lord when we are conscious of our feebleness, when we are assaulted, when we know ourselves to be outside. Run to the Lord. And the text then says that he runneth into it and is safe. And it's interesting tracing the idea of, of running. Of course, it means to move quickly. Speed is of the essence. Lose no time. It's interesting when you see how the word, uh, as I say, is employed in the scriptures. You can trace it out um, yourself, perhaps. Uh, let me just give some of the, the earlier references uh, and it builds something of a picture. First time is when the three strangers come to Abram's tent and he runs to greet them. And then immediately after that, he runs to his flocks and his herds to find an animal with which to, to feed them. And he runs. He, he goes vigorously. He doesn't amble out. He doesn't sort of walk wearily towards these approaching strangers. He runs to greet them. And he runs then to provide something for them. In Genesis 24, there's a lot of running going on. It's a very busy chapter. You've got Abram's servant, probably Eliezer, going to seek a wife for Isaac. And I remember he prays that the Lord would bring the right person along and uh, it would be somebody who that would draw water for him and so forth. And when this girl comes out, he, he gets down and he runs to meet her. And when he asks for water for the camels, she draws water and then runs to get more water. And then when he presents her with uh, the gifts and says who he is, she runs back to her family to tell them who she has met, and when she tells them, Laban then runs back to meet Eliezer. So there's, there's a lot of running going on. Uh, these are people who are, they're, I think, excited. Uh, I can't think of a better way of describing what's going on. Here's a man praying that the Lord would direct him to a certain individual, and she appears. That's exciting. I think we're allowed to talk about being excited by what God does. That's exciting, that's thrilling. He's, he's enthused by this and he runs to meet her because that's God's answer. You don't want this sort of, you know, I'll get there eventually. I want to, I want to embrace this answer, as it were. And, and she's thrilled. And she runs to get more water. She runs to tell her family. Her family are thrilled and they run to meet Eliezer. There's something thrilling. There's excitement. And later on, uh, Rachel runs to Laban to tell him that she has met Jacob and who uh, he is. And again, Laban then runs. So he must have been a decent runner. I don't think of Laban as being much of a runner maybe, but you know, there, there's potentially one of the better runners in the Bible. He does a lot of it. Uh, he's running to uh, meet Jacob as well. Then you find Esau running to meet Jacob again. So Jacob's perhaps the, the least good runner because everybody's running to him. He doesn't seem to be running to them, if you want to think of it that way. Joseph was brought hastily out of prison when Pharaoh called for him. It's the idea of running. And you've got the young men. Remember when Eldad and Medad in the camp were prophesying, the two out of the 70 that were set apart by the Lord. And a young man ran to tell Moses what was going on in the camp. There's a sense of urgency about what was going on, at least in his mind. And uh, Aaron in, in uh, number 16 runs into the camp because of the plague to make an atonement and to stay the plague. So these and many other passages about people running to do something, there was, there was haste. The matters were important, but there were also, there were matters that they wanted to deal with as quickly as possible. They weren't issues that they felt that they could just dilly-dally over. So whether they were situations in which they rejoiced or situations that were, at least in their understanding at the time, were, were bad or, or dangerous or, or, or difficult, or whether they actually were in the case of the plague in the camp. They were matters that required urgency. What matter is there in our lives, in our spiritual life, that does not require a degree or a sense of urgency? What is it that takes place in our lives where we can say, well, I can, I can turn to the Lord eventually. It'll be time enough to do it later. 
And it's one of the things I, I, I suppose that the past year has impressed upon a good number of God's people. I don't know how many, but hopefully more rather than less. That there's a sense of certainly need. But there's also a sense of urgency. There's also a sense in which we need to be running, going swiftly to the Lord. Certainly in our personal walk, when we feel vulnerable, when we know ourselves to be assaulted, run. And again, not just the fear of the enemy. Yes, we should run from the presence of sin. And Joseph reminds us of that. But we're running to the Lord because of who he is. Because he is a refuge, as we've noted. This only refuge, but he does exist. There is a refuge. And he is such a refuge, such a faithful refuge, such a secure refuge, such a loving refuge, who has revealed himself. He's, he's shown himself to us to be this in, in, order, in order to induce us, to encourage us to come to him and to come to him swiftly, to flee to him. So don't, don't leave off fleeing to some other time and say, I'll do it. Flee in the moment when you need the Lord. Flee to be fleeing to him, as it were, all of the time, to take our refuge in him. Our direction, in a sense, constantly should be this because we, we always need his protection. We always need to be in him. Our problem is that too often we are wandering away. We stray. And, and it must be our bent that we are going back again, that we are being called back when, when something happens and we are alerted, that we run back again to find safety in the Lord. So be running to the Lord constantly and to seek him for his refuge because those that run into this refuge, we're told they are safe or they are set aloft. The idea of being set upon that rock. And this is the, the language in particular of the Psalms, where the, he, the psalmist talks about being set uh, uh, up upon that rock above his enemies that would come against him. And that he finds refuge in the shadow of the rock in the weary land where there is no water. He, he's set above these things. They cannot touch him anymore. The idea, uh, certainly not uh, as far back in, in history as the time of Solomon, but you think of some of the, the towers in our own nation that were erected to give people safety from the marauding Vikings and so forth, where the door uh, in the tower was set uh, many feet up uh, above ground level. Uh, so you climbed a ladder to get into the tower, you pulled the ladder in and you shut the door and the enemy was uh, hindered greatly in getting in because you were set up above them. And the Lord lifts us above these things. How far above them? Well, where, where do we hide? We hide in Christ and our life is hid with Christ in God. We set our affections above because that's where our life is. That's where we are hidden. That's where our security is tonight. These things that we feel, they can't touch us in the sense that they cannot get to where our life is hidden with Christ and God. They can't get at that, which is the most important thing because whilst there are things that touch us here on earth, we remember that our struggle is not with flesh and blood. We, we encounter flesh and blood. We see flesh and blood. We feel and we hear flesh and and blood, but we have to remember that's not where the struggle really is. The struggle is actually with something deeper than flesh and blood. The struggle is on another level, it's on a spiritual level. That's where the real battle and the real struggle and the real danger and the real just the way that the prince of the power of the air seeks to manifest himself either to terrify us or to woo us, to induce us or to scare us. He manifests himself in some way. But yet the real battle is a spiritual one and, and in that sense we are kept safe in the one who is above and lifts us to himself. So may we run to the Lord tonight. May we know that we've got safety. 
and may we be constantly running to him to be secure from all manner of wickedness, from sin that plagues us, that, are, that confronts us day by day. And may we tonight, each one of us, those that are absent from us too, the church here, the church that meets in Hebron, the other churches and, and God's people generally in our time, may we know what it is to, to find refuge in the Lord in these evil and wicked days. May there be a, a sense of urgency about us to flee, to flee from sin, to flee from temptation and to hide in the Lord, hidden in the hollow of his pierced hand. Never foe can follow, never traitor stand. May we hide in the Lord Jesus Christ day and daily. May the Lord